In surgery, we say the only bleeding you should worry about is your own or the bleeding you can hear. This is what we would describe as audible bleeding. Hi, my name is Dr. Rich Hilton, and you're watching my channel, Knife Skills. Today, I'm gonna react to a scene from Grey's Anatomy, where they have their fatality rounds. Fatality. Now, usually it's not called fatality rounds, it's called morbidity and mortality rounds. And the reason why it's called morbidity and mortality rounds is because morbidities, where an injury or something unexpected happens to a patient but they don't die, is just as important. And in fact, the branding has changed. They're usually now called quality improvement rounds. The idea being that if we phrase the experience as an opportunity for everyone to improve, the buy-in and growth from going through those rounds is Better. Now to understand, let's dive into this scene where we see a resident operating on a patient. You know, this is my favorite time of day. The sun burns the fog that settled overnight, so there's a little more traction. Okay, I get it. His footsteps are like ASMR, which puts people to sleep. You really shouldn't play this while your hands are in someone's body. And when you're a lead surgeon, you can choose. Now for context, in this season of Grey's Anatomy, they're dealing with a uh, doctor shortage from the pandemic. And they developed the system called the Weber system, where residents have an opportunity to operate independently as a way to help improve and deal with the labor shortage in the operating room. Now, as an academic surgeon, I'm very comfortable with residents operating independently. We have something called entrustable professional activities, which is essentially any part of an operation can be delegated to a resident who has demonstrated the skill and competency to perform that task in the past. In fact, an entire operation can be an entrusted professional activity, but this is not a tool to deal with a doctor's shortage. In fact, as a attending physician, I need to be available immediately if there's any concerns for the resident. I can't be double booked, for example, doing something else. I have to be either right in the operating room or very nearby in case something were to occur wrong. Suction. Okay. Page Dr. Weber, please. Dr. Schmidt, according to the method, we are supposed to wait to continue until he arrives. This dissection is routine for me at this point. I'll get it started and Weber will be here soon. So the procedure they're performing is an ileostomy reversal. Now, an ileostomy is a situation where we've made a communication between the small bowel and the skin, and there's many reasons for that, but usually there's some kind of problem with the gastrointestinal tract and the colon, and it won't heal properly, so we decide to bring out an ileostomy. But very often, once that situation has resolved or patient has been on appropriate treatments for a period of time, they decide they don't want to keep it permanently. And so, we try, if we can, to reverse the ileostomy, close it and have the small bowel once again connected to the colon. Now, ileostomies can be reversed in many different ways. If you're reversing it through a midline laparotomy incision like they're doing here, that suggests that this is a patient who's a bit more complicated and they've had maybe multiple operations or disease process that can make the abdomen a bit more hostile. So it's a bit more of an advanced situation. And again, if you have two residents working together on this problem, they should be keen to the fact that they might need help in the operating room sooner rather than later. I should have put on the holiday one from last season. Trudges through the snow. He's bleeding. From where? I, I can't see suction. Where is it? Where is it? So some dramatic bleeding there. In surgery, we say the only bleeding you should worry about is your own or the bleeding you can hear. This is what we would describe as audible bleeding. Residents are great at dealing with blood loss and dealing with bleeding. One of the first things you do and learn in surgery is how to put pressure on a vessel. And there's not a single blood vessel in the body that without pressure, you can control the bleeding. I've definitely had cases in trauma surgery with that much blood on the floor. That's not uncommon and we're able to deal with it and cope with it with good blood transfusions, good anesthetic communication, and experience as surgeons to deal with blood loss. It's been so long since I've seen a waterfall in person. Oh, this is just the best. Yeah, I'm gonna stay here a while, you guys. I'm Turn that off. off. Schmidt? Call it. 
the time of death? No, you call it, Schmidt. This is your patient, your OR, your hands that operate it. Call it. Clearly, Schmidt is in distress. And I can understand the goal to hold him accountable, to make sure that he feels that he is responsible. But I think forcing him to call it publicly like that is piling on. And I think probably contributes ultimately to his psychological distress that prevents his performance later on in the episode and season. So let's fast forward to a future episode and look at Eminem rounds. And I will say, when I was a resident, Eminem and Browns were almost exactly like this. Attendings on one side, residents on the other, a bit of grandiosity with the chief of surgery as well. Um, so it is an intimidating environment, and I think they demonstrate it very well in this video. Dr. Schmidt. The case is a 26 year old male with history of ulcerative colitis. I felt that I needed better exposure of the small bowel. So I reached into the cavity. At that point, everything was dry and ready for anastomosis. As stated, the patient. It's been so long since I've seen Dr. a Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt, continue. Uh, Everything was dry and um, the field was clean. So I asked for the GI stapler. So Schmidt's clearly having an anxiety attack here in front of the surgical community in this hospital. And we can all relate to that. I can definitely think of times when I stuttered my way through a case presentation at M&M's or I was worried that someone might make some kind of accusation that I wouldn't be able to respond to. That pressure is real. And Schmidt is struggling with feeling guilt and responsibility for the death of this otherwise healthy young man. There, uh, there was no indication of any abnormal anatomy or friable structures, right? That you could see, I mean. What? Meaning you couldn't have predicted that the aorta was going to rupture. This is just the best. Yeah, I'm going to stay here a while, you guys. It was an unanticipated complication. Is there a question in there somewhere, Helm? I didn't think so. Schmidt, go. Uh, that, that was the, the, the field filled with blood and um, he's dead. Dr. Schmidt, look, we are here. To, Dr. Schmidt, no, no. We are here to determine what happened and how to Hey, no, 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 the m M&M isn't finished. Um, and until Dr. Schmidt returns, Dr. Weber will take the question. So I do like how Dr. Bailey is trying to make sure, even though Schmidt is struggling and running out of the room, to make sure that the environment is meant to be improvement in quality. And that's really what m ms are all about. Human factors are a huge part of doing medical care and errors and problems in human factors are going to happen as long as human beings are holding the scalpel, human beings are reading radiology reports, human beings are making decisions. But there are a lot of ways we can improve the system to reduce the risk that a human mistake is gonna cause a harm to another patient. Having these discussed openly in M&M rounds is absolutely critical. Morbidity and mortality rounds or M&Ms or quality insurance rounds are an intimidating experience. If you're gonna practice as a surgeon, you're gonna to have to present cases in M&M rounds and knowing and understanding that the ultimate role is for quality improvement rather than finding blame is how you can face those rounds and have the attitude of constant improvement. If you're interested to know more about error in the operating room and error in the medical community, please click on this video down below where I talk a little bit about how we as surgeons handle errors when they occur. Once again, thank you for watching. My name is Dr. Rich Hillsden and have a great day.